Hi, I'm Vic Bearcroft and today I'm going to show you how to create a lovely atmospheric painting of a wolf howling in a forest in early autumn mist. To start with, I've sketched a fairly loose sketch of our subject, our wolf, um, whose name is Nuka by the way. So I've loosely sketched Nuka onto the dark grey paper just to get all the proportions and the shapes and position. Um, so you can see this, there's a lot of um, loose sketchy lines underneath but uh, if you do them, if you, are, if you are sketching this freehand, if you use a hard black pastel, use it quite lightly. So uh, to begin with all these initial sketch marks are very very light, I can almost rub them away. If they're too dark then they're going to be uh, showing through <coughs> subsequent layers of pastel. Once you're happy with your proportional sketch, then we can move on to do uh, a tonal sketch proper. This is the kind of underpainting. Gives us the uh, more of the shapes and the form in three-dimensional form, that is. So, uh, if you like, it's the first foundation of any kind of painting, the tonal underpainting. So the whole thing is going to be rendered in, in grey tones, including the background. So let's begin just by tidying up um, our wool sketch a little bit. So rounding off some of the sharp corners and things like that. We'll begin with the nose. Uh, one thing to be aware of when you're working on this sketch and you're adding a little bit more black pastel to it is your lighting. Because we're going to have a, a lighting coming low at a low angle from the left hand side. So early autumn, very cool morning. That's going to come down this way. So it's going to pick up uh, a highlighted outline all the way around here and a little bit on top of the head which means that we want to avoid doing or sketching or drawing or even painting a hard black line where your highlights are going to appear. It'll be harder to get that highlight on at the end. But what I'm not after at this stage is that ultra fine details because we've got a, you know, a fair bit to go on top of this. If we do start off with too much detail in the beginning then you're going to find that a lot of that gets obliterated with uh, layers of colour and tone and so on. So save your really fine details till later on. Just to think of it as you know, a fairly comprehensive sketch. So we're looking for shapes first and especially the real classic shape of the howling wolf's mouth. We only see the bottom two teeth when the head's thrown back and howling. So the curves around the top part of the mouth, the open part, and then add a few more curves onto the lower lip. So I'm using for this a rounded corner of the hard black pastel. Uh, save the sharp corners if you're using a new pastel that is, save your sharp corners till later on in case you need them. You might not need them but just in case. But always sketch with a slightly rounded corner. It gives you a softer mark and not too heavy, not too dark either. So I'm going to avoid doing a hard line around here. That's pale fur on the neck and I'll leave that pretty much as it is and, and certainly around the chin as well so that we can get that nice crisp highlight on it later on. Uh, we can put in things like the whisker follicles at this stage. More a case when you're doing whisker follicles on uh, canines and felines is to look for the shape because they, they follow the curve, that curve around the cheeks, around the muzzle. So just a few dotted lines like that to begin with. And then we want to get additional features in, like the centre of the forehead, the shape of the eyebrow, the pale eyebrow on the top. And a more definitive shape on that eye from the teared up back. So you can't really see the eye as much on this one because it's very dark, but the eye is usually sort of thrown back into the uh, corner away from the tear ducts when the head's raised and the walls are howling. So it's going to be about there. 
And then, <coughs> very useful when we have, or when we're painting a grey wolf, is they do have sections of light, medium and dark fur, uh, short, medium and long fur as well. So this area underneath the eye, you see it's got quite a sort of definitive triangular shape. So I'm going to go with that just to pretty much sketch the outline of that uh, shape of fur there. Then coming down from the corner of the eye, the next shape, which I've, you see I've suggested these shapes already like that. The shapes of the different coloured fur, or the different tones. At this stage, as we work around, we want to start to get an impression or feeling of the length and the direction of the fur. If you think of this as a, as a fur map to begin with, this fur is all about the length and direction and the thickness and so on. So this initial, or these initial marks that you make are going to give you a kind of fur map which you can then follow through subsequent layers. So again, I'm, at this point, I'm just separating the different tones of fur, the dark grey, light grey and mid greys and so on, all the time looking for the length and direction of that particular fur. And you notice when you're painting light fur, uh, you can get that fur map from the shadows in between different clumps of fur. There's some quite dark shadows here, for example. And they will give you that shape, <coughs> that length and that direction. We'll come back to the ear shortly. Let's get the lower shape sorted out a little more. Uh, to the dark tip. You can probably see where the ear originally was there in that light sketch and I've just brought it forward. That's the beauty of doing a really light sketch to begin with. So you can make adjustments. If you commit yourself too early to doing lots and lots of fine detail and try to draw it out as perfectly as you can, inevitably you're going to come unstuck unless you have to be a brilliant technical drawer. You might come and stuck with uh, having something in the wrong shape. You've got to try and go back and adjust it. And once your pastel is on the law, even light, then it's not going to go anywhere. The best you can hope for is to rub it down to a lighter tone and paint over it, which you can do. So again, a little bit shorter fur coming over onto the shoulder there. What I'm using now is rather than a rounded corner of the pastel, I'm starting to turn it around to use the full, eventually use the full quarter inch width there. And that's ideal for sketching thicker fur, but the thick fur around the shoulders and the neck. Really dense winter coat these guys have, of course. So not too heavy to begin with. There's a good rule to follow when you're working on the law is paint it in light layers. Lots of light layers and then you'll get a, a deeper, richer, softer painting at the end of the day. So try to avoid doing heavy layers, which will give you, which you can do of course if you like that sort of thing, but it gives you a much heavier, less soft feel to the painting. And again, thicker part of the pastel, or wider part of the pastel for this thicker fur along the back of the neck. And essentially what you're doing is you're looking for all the dark bits. So as one bit of fur overlays another it's going to cast a shadow. So that overlays that, that overlays that and so on. And each time you start with a, a shadow on the next bit you can start to cut out the shape of the light fur above it. And that way you can see the different layers of fur as they fold and roll over the neck in this case. <coughs> okay, so let's uh, move up to the slightly finer details. We'll start with the ear. So here's the base of the ear. Now we've got uh, shorter, thicker fur around the edge. As always in mammals with hairy ears, the, ear, the hair grows from the inner side 
or the inner edge of the ear is the outer edge over the center the ear hole towards the outer edge so always in this direction it is shorter towards the tip and some more shorter hairs around the base attaching it to the head about there and then we've got a little chunky fur on the neck again you can see on the reference photograph when you look at it you can see it's got these shadows in between these lighter clumps of fur and of course you don't have to be exact with all those different shadows and shapes as long as it looks reasonably similar to a reference because whatever happens you know if you take the photograph again a few minutes later and roughly the same position it's all going to look a little bit different so this is pale fur so I'm not uh, paint, not drawing these shadows in too heavily and um, around here <coughs> these big grey sections that is very very short so I'm using a rounded corner just to begin to get a little bit of texture in there so very short strokes almost little dabs with the corner to get that very short textured fur I'm going to put a few more of those in later on as well And then we have in the chin, little dark flecks, a lot of scent glands in the chin. So you can mark those in. <clears throat> Just re-outline a little bit the two lower teeth. So I've got the position, I can see where they are. <clears throat> now, at this point, that's probably enough for our initial sketch. Uh, some of the darker bits we can enhance later um, and then we'll talk about how dark to make it when we get there. The next thing we want to do is add some tonal values. So think about uh, tonal values as giving you form. For example if you drew a ball you'd start with a circle but a circle isn't a ball, a circle is just a disc. If you wanted to make that into a ball you'd have to have dark tone, mid tone, light tone, highlight, shadow, mid tone. Uh, same with anything else. So anything that has at least three tones starts to have form. Now the great thing for us is that, as I said earlier on, our wolf has dark fur, mid fur and light fur. We can do all of that with the tonal values. And of course, extremely dark in the eye, nose and mouth. So let's go for the uh, mid-tone fur first. Remember that it's always better to do two or three light layers and build that up rather than try and go for the tone you think you need straight away. So if we start with this big brief uh, around uh, the face, brush it on lightly with the side of your black pastel and then rub it in. The rubbing is a very important part of using velour because it pushes any pastel dust into the fibres of the velour and traps it there, which means it's not going to smudge. I can rub that as hard as I like, it's not going to smudge. And the more you rub it in, then the more it fixes. So it's self-fixing. What I'm going to leave around here are the, the very light bits of fur, like the eyebrow, above and below the eye. So I'm going to leave those as a grey paper, and the dark grey paper will suddenly become, appear to be a lot lighter, the highlight colour. And again, when you're doing this with the flat of a pastel, make sure to follow the length and direction of the fur, or at least the direction, at the very least, because if you catch the edge of the pastel then at least you know it's going the right way. It's not going to be uh, horizontal or vertical when it should be diagonal for example. So I'll do this a little bit in the neck. I'm going to shadow under that paler bit of fur there and then it starts to get a little bit lighter down here. And again, if you press on too hard and try to get your darks too dark straight away, you're going to lose quite a bit of your initial sketch as well. This way I can still see the fur map underneath. Now, admittedly that fur map wants enhancing a little bit, but 
Ideally, we should wait until we've got all the tones and indeed a bit of colour on there before we start to enhance it too much. So again, I'm just trying to leave pockets of paler fur here and there, highlighted fur, or even just paler fur. So when it's we've got a roll of fur like that over the neck and the shoulder, it usually appears to be lighter because it's catching the light. And in some cases, it could just be paying the fur. Uh, that's okay. Uh, the whole of the ear, most of the ear, apart from maybe a little bit of the hairs in the midsection, and have an initial light grey tone. Okay, as can uh, around the muzzle. Um, when it comes to noses, the wolf's nose, dog's nose, etc. Again, start with a mid-tone, but don't just shade or colour in the tip of the nose. That's joined to the rest of the muzzle, and you, if you follow it through on the photograph, you'll see that carries a, a sort of mid-tone into the muzzle itself, and it needs a little bit of a colour as well, which we'll look at later. So, inside of the mouth. And... The lower lip coming down into the chin. Remember, this is just our initial tone. It's not quite there yet. Uh, also, using tone, we can show underlying structure. So, here we've got uh, a line of teeth, a upper jaw, and a lower jaw. In between the upper jaw and the lower jaw, uh, there's an indentation. And there's nothing much underneath. So, that's created by a little self shadow. And it starts to give you undulations in the anatomy as well. Finish off with a little bit of light grey tone into that pale fur. And that's our first layer. So, if we get in the eye, the eye is quite dark. So the next layer is going to be slightly darker fur here and there. I can see some already around the base of the ear. So again, just brush another Fairly light layer on top of what you already got. It does help to squint at your reference as well. Squint at your photograph and squint at your painting. Sit back and screw your eyes at the squint at it. That will help to see the tones much clearer. Um, I did say about what kind of tones we're trying to achieve in this. Well, I think the original photograph was taken on quite a reasonably bright day. And it certainly wasn't early morning in the mist or anything like that. But with early morning light, especially in the autumn and winter, the light is going to be much softer than it will be in spring or summer. And if the light is softer, then your shadow is going to be softer, as well as your highlights. So nothing as strong as a full sun. So therefore, what I'm doing is not trying to make the dark fur and the shadows as strong as they are on the original reference. I'm just trying to knock them back a little bit. Bearing in mind I can always add some more shadows later on if I don't think it's dark enough. So I'm trying to soften the whole appearance of it. You imagine a misty morning in autumn somewhere in a forest way up north, North America or Canada. It's going to be quite a soft hazy light, partly because of that mist as well. The mist will soften things up quite a lot. So a little bit darker around the tip of the ear. And just below that ridge of hair. And then we'll do the Darker bits again on the nose. I'm just going to make the nostrils a little bit darker to start with. And then go over the whole tip of the nose with another layer. Bring that down just into the snout, into the muzzle as well. So the nose is joined on to the snout. And a little bit darker in the centre of the mouth. Again, we can make it the full dark later on. We don't have to do that straight away. Lower lip down into the chin. 
So as you can see, it ends up looking quite sort of soft, <coughs> not too much detail, but uh, detail will come later on, so don't worry about that. At this point, now we also want to think about the background. The background is part of the tonal underpainting. But um, I decided to keep it quite simple for this painting. So in other words, uh, maybe a pine forest somewhere on the northern Canadian-American border, somewhere like that, where you've got a pine forest, lots of fairly straight trees, keep it simple, with light filtering through those trees. Now remember, you can also use the uh, three-tone uh, issue in this as well, insofar as the darker your tree, your darker the tone of your tree, the closer it is to you, the lighter it is, the further away it is in the mist. So using the side of the pastel, basically just make some initial strokes. And the, uh, light strokes to begin with, don't uh, go too, too mad too soon. And try and vary them a little bit. So you might have some thin ones. You might have a couple leaning over like that. Just think of it as an initial tonal composition. And don't overthink it. Just make some lines like that, and those can represent distant trees or trees that are a little bit closer, and you can decide that. What I've done is, you see I've faded them out about here. So this is the, this is the forest floor, and there's going to be a mist rising up there, so you're not going to see the base of these trees at all. What I can do now is pick out one or two that maybe want to be a little bit closer, a little bit darker. Uh, another layer on that one perhaps, maybe. A darker one there, maybe that one. But you can decide, you don't have to do an exact copy of this one. And maybe and just in between each layer, just lean back and squint. This one could be probably the closest one of all. That could be a little bit darker still. And you can always add, add more later if you want to, so some individual little branches or something that are just peeping through the fog in this especially on the closer ones just to add a little bit of interest and this is going to be fairly muted background it's going to be fairly soft and misty anyway so we're not going to see an awful lot of that so that's a good time to put your pastel down grab all of your board and give everything a really good look now that guarantees your pastel is firmly fixed in the paper. What it also does, it softens some of the edges and just spreads a tiny little bit, not too much, but a tiny little bit of uh, grey tone into the lighter areas. So that's our <coughs> tone on the painting, pretty much complete. What we're going to do next is do the second foundation. So if you're doing a coloured painting then Obviously you need a foundation for those colours. I always like to uh, limit it to three colours. So in other words, if I'm doing a warm painting, it might be two warm and one complementary cool colour. Or a cool painting like this could be two cool and one complementary warm colour. In other words, opposite on the colour wheel. I like to keep them simple. Simple colours, reasonably strong, for the foundation of course if you're going to put a lot of layers of uh, texture and whatnot over the top then some of this colour is going to disappear quite quickly so you need to keep it reasonably strong so what I've got here I've got two cool colours one's my pale green there's a pale blue the sky blue I think that is and then we've got a warm golden brown here that's a complementary colour so the first thing I'm going to do is go over the background <coughs> now the background it's got to be uh, basically green. It's a dense forest in autumn, with a lot of greenery in there. So all I have to do is basically cover that with two or three light layers of green. Now what I'd like to do, rather than go up and down like this, <coughs> which can look quite patchy, imagine there's a soft light in between these trees, or going over the trees as well. What I'd like to do is use all sort of higgledy piggledy squares. So use the flat of the green pastel and just make little one inch squares going in different directions, horizontally, vertically, diagonally and so on. So I'll just do this little section to begin with. That's a light layer. 
<coughs> what the grey paper does, of course, is it cools that green down. If you use a warm paper, like a sandy coloured paper, then you've got a warmer finish to that green. So, once I've done a layer of little squares, I rub it round and round with fingers, or you can use a bit of paper towel, or something like that. And that starts to even it out. And it gives you a softer, almost like glow. Another thing to remember is because we want to paint background first and paint the subject over the top, naturally, then in order to make the background look like it's behind your subject, just go into the edge a little bit. I always go into the edge of the wall, just a, a fraction with the green. That's not a problem because we can paint over that pale green very, very easily without affecting anything else. If you try to be too careful and go around your outline really, really carefully, then inevitably you'll end up with a sort of grey line all the way around it with nothing in it, no colour. So we want the colour to be behind the wall. <coughs> okay, rub it round and round. We're going to bring that down into the foreground as well. This will represent our misty forest floor eventually. Same procedure. Lots of squares. I'm not trying to fill the paper in. So if you get a few gaps of grey showing through, that's fine. You might want to you might decide you want to leave those. Or if you don't want to leave them, you can fill them in with another one or two light layers. But better that than keep control than flood it with too much colour and suddenly realise it's too much. Again, lean back and sprint. You know, we've got a, we're getting a nice and soft hazy green effect, which I like. And we're going to go over the trees as well. So I'm going to give it another layer and see what that looks like. And of course, everybody has different hand pressures. You know, I can't guarantee that two layers for me will work the same as two layers for you. Your hand pressure may be heavier, may be lighter, so you may need four. If you are hand pressure is a little bit lighter, so judge on your own areas. Lean back, squint, see what colour you've got and see how it's working for you. So we can always add some more later on. I prefer not to overload it with colour at this stage. It's important to get a, at least a background colour behind the subject before we start on that. Again, rub it in, give it a good rub, make sure all the pastel pigment is fixed into the paper and already even with just that simple layer of colour over the background you can begin to get a feeling for that, that atmosphere. So we'll maybe come back to the green later on. Uh, in the meantime we'll deal with the base colours for our wolf. Uh, grey wolves. Now they're not completely grey, they can be grey. Grey wolves can also be black, they can be brown, they can be white. It's just the, the name of the, the, the subspecies of wolf, the grey wolf. We can have tawny colours, brown and, and so on. So this is a, a nuclear here, it's a bit grey and a bit brown. But one of the colours you may not think about is the blues. Grey by itself can look very, very flat. So grey fur can be enhanced by adding a little touch of blue. So we're going to deal, deal with that. Also, the tip of the nose, you may often see photographs of dogs, for example, with black noses that shine blue. Uh, so if we use a bit of blue under the nose and the muzzle and around the chin, those grey areas will then uh, take on more depth and just being a flat grey. But also, it helps to cool it down. So for example, the tip of the nose, the nose pad, using a soft pale blue pastel, not too heavy of course, if we go all around <coughs> the muzzle, and indeed in, inside the mouth as well, and you can see then the tip of the nose is still attached to the muzzle, the snout. Also, if we go over all of these grey bits around the chin, it also does help to add depth to your grey. If you just leave it as flat black or flat grey, for the, especially for the nose pad, black with a white shine on it, it can look very dull. 
So I'm going to give a little hint of blue to some of this mid grey fur. I mean, a lot of that won't be even noticeable by the time you've finished. But it's going to help to balance out the, the warmth of the browns. So just where, and indeed on the photograph, just where you can see hints of blue. Once you start looking for it, you'll probably see it everywhere. But don't be afraid to add these seemingly unlikely colours. They do add a lot of value, and only hints of those colours will show through at the end anyway. So that's probably about it. Give that a rub. <coughs> and then we'll go with our golden brown for the brown tones. So our grey wolf usually has a little bit of brown on the bridge of the nose, a bit sort of red brown or golden brown sometimes, but below the eye. Again, not too heavy. We want to keep the painting fairly soft, remember. Give it a good rub, lean back and squint. A little bit around the chin, just below the black lower lip. We see little hints here and there, and try and sort of feed it into the other colour you've got as well. So not just a hard line between one colour and another; the one feeds into another. So around the back of the ears are usually sort of brownish, so that would just peep over the. The edge like that. And then that's the foundation. <coughs> We're going to build on that, and as we build on it bit by bit with the detail, a lot of this will disappear, will be very, very faint. But you've got to have a good foundation to build on, which is true in many things, of course. All of a rub, and then I'll finish off a little bit down here. And again, when you look at your photograph, the more you study it, the more of these colours you're going to find. Okay, <coughs> so that's our foundations complete. Two foundations. We have our tonal sketch, which gives our shape and form in fairly simple terms. Remember, the key word there is sketch. We've got our background sketched out. In terms of the composition, a little bit of depth, depth beginning, we'll work on that a bit later. And finally, our second foundation for a coloured painting, getting some strong, vivid, often unlikely, unusual colours you may not think of using in the foundation. So, once we've done that, then we can begin to add in a little bit more details, and we'll be starting with the background on this. So back to the background, now uh, our trees and our forest background at the moment all have pretty much the, reasonably the same value. So I'm going to keep some of them maybe around this area quite light so that's fading into the distance. Around the edges of the paint I'm going to bring them forward a little bit, make them a little bit darker. That will act as a kind of frame and give us a nice light area in the middle where the centre of attention is, our wolf's head. So using the black hard pastel again, and this is going to give us more depth in our forest. Just use this, the side of it, the flat side, gently. Again, we don't want to overdo it. Better to underdo it and add to it if necessary. Make this one again a little bit darker. Because this is early morning, kind of early misty morning, I don't want to start adding any colours or any more detail to the trees. I just want them to be sort of ghostly, shadowy shapes coming out of the mist. I think that will give it more atmosphere. Uh, maybe a little bit darker on that one. Let it fade out on the forest floor, remember. Uh, just keep leaning back, get a sense of the, the depth in your painting, what you're achieving what's happening bit by bit. Uh, one or two a little bit darker over here, maybe a couple of thinner ones. Again, a few visible branches as they get a little bit closer. Give it a little 
more up and then I want to go over that again with a layer of green. So I don't want to see the grey of the trees, I want them to be enveloped in this green, almost enchanted mist. Now, I can go up and down this time because I'm, by doing this up and down motion I've already got the background painted. I can even suggest here and there, cutting the edge of the pastel, some highlights on some of the trees. Okay, so let's make sure that the darkest colour you've got is dark green, very dark green and not grey. I think that should do. So we'll come to the foreground later. Now we'll start adding some details to our wall, or bringing back some details I should say. <coughs> Starting with the black pastel again. Um, so you, you've got a choice, you can use either a slightly rounded corner if you want to keep it fairly soft and indeed when we're doing the thicker fur around here I should be using a rounder part of the pastel. Some of the finer details you can use a sharp corner for. Uh, so if we start with the nose again I'll show you what I mean. So if I use a slightly sharper corner to bring the nostrils out. But I'm trying to avoid pressing on too hard. I don't want, don't want it to be too hard, too dark and too sharp. I want to keep that overall sort of softness. But any sharper, sharper details in, in the nostrils. I'm going to be limited around the edges. And a nice soft shadow inside the nostrils. But you can do as much detail as you want, of course, you know, this, uh, there's no hard and fast rule as to how much detail to put in. You can keep it very, very loose and as though you painted it with a, a wide brush, the whole thing. Or you can do loads and loads of detail as though you painted the whole thing with a zero brush. That's entirely up to you. So a little bit of shading on the lower part of the nose. You can just see hints of that blue showing through, that's all we want. Just a little hint. Okay, then we'll bring that down around the edge of the mouth. So we define the edges. And of course, on this edge, this visible edge, we can see, just about see, the fur around the edge of the lips. Okay, if you don't want to put that in, you don't have to. So define that edge, leave a little bit of sort of blue grey underneath, but those aren't too far too, so it's about there. And all around it, in between the teeth, you can fill that dark space in. So around a corner, fill that in. But I would avoid making it too dark until the very end. Judge it bit by bit. Tones, tonal values change throughout the painting. They're not fixed when you start, they do change throughout the painting depending on what, what you put next to it. So always just hold back a little bit I think on your final darks until the end and then decide if you want to make them darker. So a little bit more shading just underneath the tip of the nose so it joins onto the muzzle. And then these whisker follicles can be made more like silver dots. Now you're not going to see a lot of whiskers on the wolf. And they do have them of course like any other, other canines but you're not really going to see them so I wouldn't worry about putting actual whiskers in as long as you've got a an idea of the whisper follicles where the whisper grow out of that should be enough. So we've got a darker line around the bottom edge of the lower lip, slightly bluer around the top where the light's catching it. And you see already that blue tone that we put around the lower lip, for example, has all but disappeared. It's good to show you don't have to worry about putting a, a strong collar underneath. When you start putting detail and tone back over the top, 
all but disappears. You can always add some more in, of course, if, this, if it disappears too much. <coughs> so fur texture. Okay, starting with sort of mid thickness fur texture here in the neck. Bring out those shadows again, maybe adding a little bit more in the way of individual hairs or individual clumps of hair, I should say. You're not going to see individual hairs as much, you'll see clumps of fur. And always do a little firm stroke as you're working through. We're going to come all the way around here and finish up off in the head, by the way. So a few slightly lighter clumps of fur around here. Notice uh, that clumps of fur, no matter what the animal is, always have the same, always follow the same sort of pattern. They all form little V shapes at the end. So no matter how big or how small, you can see these little V shapes. Right, so not regular V shapes, of course, but in general. So a little bit more shadow around there, a little bit more cutting out of that paler bit of fur. You see what I mean by cutting out? By working on the shadow underneath that pale clump of fur, I can cut out the, the edge of that pale clump of fur with the black pastel. So you're not just working one bit of fur in isolation, you're working on the bit next to it as well. Now what I'm sw doing is switching to the quarter inch width of that pastel, because this is thicker, shorter, denser fur underneath that around the neck. And you see these almost V-shaped points going back into the front of the neck. Good firm stroke. And we cut this bit of fur out as well, same procedure, we're working on the shadow underneath but at the same time we can cut out the edges of the pale fur above and work on those dark shadows, I'm not going to make them as dark as the original reference so I'll keep them fairly subdued, I keep leaning back and squinting at it, that's probably going to be plenty dark enough for me Again, just use the wider end of the hard pastel to get that suggestion of thicker fur, thicker, shorter clumps of fur around here. And again, longer fur towards the top. And around the base of the ear. A little bit of shadow underneath the ear we can build into that clump of fur as well. And a little bit paler in terms of shadow. You can see some of the blue tones underneath this section. And along the back, thicker still. So using the quarter inch width of the pastel to get that nice thick fur, which you don't have to put too much detail in, but we can let that fade out into the corner a little bit and keep all the detail in this area. That's what people are going to be interested in. And the head and the face, that area in general. And the more of this fur texture we put back over that foundation, the second foundation, the coloured foundation, the less of a colour we can see. But it's there, it actually does add more depth to your grey tones without a doubt. A final large area of shadow down here. A little bit more texture. And you see it's all about the length, direction and thickness of the fur. And let that fade out into the corner. Give it a good rub to make it nice and soft. <coughs> and we'll work on the ears, or well, ear singular. So the base of the ear, short dark fur connecting the ear to the head. And the hairs around 
the corner. You can do individual hairs with a sharp corner if you want to, but it's probably not worth it. Okay, and very short fur around the base of the ear, the tip of the ear, I beg your pardon. Almost velvety, and that's what the paper will give you, that velvety texture. Shadow, a bit more of a shadow underneath the hairs. And then around the outer edge, much shorter fur altogether. We're going to velvety, short velvety fur around the edges and the tips of the ears, which is made visible by the velvety feel of the door, of course. Now we go to the real short fur. Here you can use a sharp corner if you want to, but basically all I need to do is just add a little bit of directional textural strokes. All those short little stabs to get that grizzled short fur effect. And you see the blue is disappearing. But that blue just really just lifts your grey tones. Gives it more depth. And again, if you want to, you can add layer upon layer of this fur texture. Go back and add more colour and so on, and add more tone. For days and days and days, the paper will take it. The paper will take probably as many layers as you can spend time painting. 100 or more layers, as long as you're using the, the harder pastels. Um, shorter texture around here, very short texture around the head. A little bit of a shadow underneath the eyebrow there. And then again, short texture in the forehead. And so far, as you notice, I've not done an outline. I haven't painted an outline at all. The outline is going to come at the end of our highlights. Now for the really short fur around the muzzle, again it's a simple matter of using tonal values. Let the paper show you the short fur texture, the velvety texture. So in these sort of blue-grey bits I'm just going to darken a tiny bit around the tip of the nose, remembering what's uh, underneath, maybe darken uh, around the tear ducts as well while we're there. And what's left as a sort of bluish highlight is where you've got something underneath that's protruding, like the, the jawbone, upper jawbone, or you've got the teeth, or something like that. Okay, so our final bit is going to be the eye, starting with the tear duct. Looking back, it's not going to be quite dark. It's, it's basically how many walk is about the eye shape. Looking back, half closed. And very typical shape. Okay, so what we'll do next is we'll start working on some highlights. Again, starting with the background. Now for this we're using white pastel, white hard pastel, and if we get the background sorted out first, as before, then we can concentrate on the final highlights on our wolf. So, what I'm going to do to begin with is um, add a little bit of mist around the base of these trees, using the same method as I did before with these little sort of, in this case, half inch or so squares. If you've got a one inch pastel, you can use one inch squares and so on. But the, um, the message is really to use little heavily pickledy squares softly. So I'll make a few square shapes so you can see. I'm not pressing on too hard. So they're all going in different directions. Like that, overlapping here and there. Remember, two or three light layers is what, you, what you're after. I just made these a little bit stronger so you can hopefully see it just start with. And put your pastel down either with your fingers or with a bit of kitchen paper which works really really well in softening these squares off. 
round and round. Okay, rub it round and round. And that creates, it begins to create a much more natural, ethereal kind of mist, rather than going round and round with your pastel. You don't see circles of mist, perfect circles of mist in nature, that's more like smoke, isn't it? What you'll see is mist, this kind of evaporating water, and it's very ethereal, very gentle, has no particular shape to it. So if you don't want a particular shape, if you don't want it to look like circles of smoke, then these random squares going in different directions, allied with a good firm rub round and round with your fingers or with your tissue paper, and you see you start to get a much more natural looking misty effect. So I'll probably do one more layer. Remember, do them very lightly. A white pastel can be very strong. So we've got a bit of mist rising up in these trees here, I think. Yeah, at all costs, don't rub, or don't put your pastel on too hard, but with your white pastel to create this mist. I'm going around and around. Good hard rub. And that should do us. So, the next thing to do is have a little bit of light coming through the trees. Now this is also a layered approach. If we imagine light filtering through the trees, coming down below angle like that, we'll start there. It's difficult to do a straight line. You can use masking tape as a guide if you want. So imagine you've got some early morning, very pale rays of light, with that pale sun just risen, but covered with grey clouds, I should imagine, up in the sky. So you can do a few layers like that, just to suggest it. But also remember that that light just doesn't go through one gap in the trees, it goes through trees, the trees in different levels. So here and there, you're going to have to um, reinstate a bit of tree in front of those rays of light, just to give it that added depth. So it looks like it's going behind some, in front of others, and so on. And of course, if you do that, and just add a little bit more green onto the ones you've just reinstated with the black pastel, it gives you even more depth. So you can keep doing that in, in layers again, now, so you've got a lot more depth in, that, in your painting. What we'll do down here is we'll have a little suggestion, darken the corner off. I don't like to see empty corners like this. So we can have a little suggestion of some uh, ferns, maybe. You don't have to paint them as individual, individual ferns. You just create sort of the way the ferns hang down like that. They go up and they hang down heavy with the morning dew. It's just a, more a matter of darkening the corner so the eye doesn't wander, up, wander off. Okay, so a little bit of a slightly darker corner there, and again, go over it with green so we have dark green as our final colour rather than grey. That will get rid of some of the mist behind it as well. We're painting from the back to the front, these different layers, you get a little bit of mist in between. Yeah, that will work. Now, finally, on our wolf, we've got no highlights. So we're going to do uh, two lots of highlights. The first is going to be our secondary highlights, which is mainly softer highlights on the fur and on anatomical shading around the muzzle and so on. Uh, the final highlights will be our primary highlights, which will be the light catching the, the outline and so on. Okay, so let's start with the secondary highlights. Uh, we'll begin down here and work our way around again. So using a rounded corner of the hard white pastel, a rounded corner will always give you a softer mark. And again, I don't want my fur highlights to be as bright as they are in the photograph. It's a diff totally different setting. So if you just reduce your tonal values, darks and lights, 
a little bit you can go and look softly lighting effect don't think you always have to go with the tone and the color you see on your reference you can adapt it okay so that's going to give us a nice soft tone for our fur highlights in keeping with the rest of the painting shorter little clumps using the quarter inch end of the white pastel as well a little bit longer here and there let's see those little pointed ends we've got and again always give them a little rub lean back and squint and just picking out some very soft highlights on these smaller thicker clumps of fur so you don't have to be ultra precise to do this you get the effect just by adjusting your pastel stroke really longer sharper to shorter thicker always they're on the side of caution don't go too much to, to too early keep it nice and soft you can always add more stronger sharper whites on top of that if you need to and using a rounded corner we can get some of these longer hairs around the back of the neck remember generally all, all, all these clumps of hair clumps of fur always come basically to a, a v-shaped point at the end and try to rub away the start of your pastel marks so you bury the roots you don't want to see the roots you want to see the shaft of the hairs and the ends but all those individual roots are buried deep in that rich wintry wolf fur coat okay that should be enough there and then we'll do the ear the shorter fur around the base of the ear that's using the quarter inch end of the pastel which is nicely rounded so it gives us a softer mark and then we've got the hairs going over from the inner edge like so, again, not too strong. Rub away the roots. Then we can just enhance the sort of shorter grizzled fur. Just a few little dots using a sharper end, sharper corner of the pastel like that. It's very short grizzled, grizzled fur, going from dark to medium to light on individual hairs. Okay, so we give that nice short fur texture. And the eyebrow, again, not as pale as it is on the reference. But they're usually lighter anyway. Okay, a little bit, very short fur around the eyes, of course, so a little bit on the cheekbone there. All I want to do here is create a, a pale brown. So we, treat that very very gently and that little addition of soft white on the cheekbone below the eye gives us that pale brown and when we come to the nose again we'll show how the underlying color the foundation color changes the tone of your highlight so we want a soft highlight on the tip of the nose that that's going to give us a very very pale blue cool highlight as opposed to that which is a warmer highlight so think about your base colors in those terms as well you know looking at the end towards the end what do you want that highlight to be on the end is it a cool highlight or a warm highlight and then put a base color down accordingly okay so we've got a little bit uh, more pale short fur which we started with our total sketch around here where we've got jaw bones and teeth 
pushing that skin forward. That gives us more of an anatomical shape there. And then around the inside of the mouth. Suggestion of a few hairs perhaps. And one little paler, slightly paler flex in the chin. And a little bit of a cool highlight on the lower lip where the light's catching it. And I think we're about ready for our primary highlights. So primary highlights, we're going to be press on a little bit harder and we bring out the shape from the background. So we've got a light catching the tip of the nose. We'll start there. So pale light, when it touches something shiny, like the tip of the nose, is going to make it slightly shinier, not pure white, not ultra glossy, but we want to be able to pick that out. So uh, and it just leaps off the background straight away. So I'm using a rounded corner, with a nice soft, soft looking highlight, but pressing on a little bit to make it fairly strong. Just round it off there. We're going to bring this all the way down the side of the mouth. And here, of course, we haven't really touched this bit, but if you want to, then we can use a sharper corner and just show some individual hairs. Like so, you see that whole shape, the mouth shape is now leaping off the background, just as we want it to. The teeth, we've got one here, and one there, and again, go around the outside of the lips, and the light's catching, the chin, and again, if you want to, you can put some individual chin whiskers on where the light's catching them. It's not something that's necessary, but it might just add a little bit of value to it. We turn it all the way around underneath the chin. And then finally, we can do this neck fur. At last, we can do the neck fur. The outline was very, very faint right from the start. Now, we can give it a lot of impact. The light's shining through the neck from behind. Of course it's pale fur, it's going to really make it stand out. So always work on the edge, take it back in from the edge and then on the inside just rub it away so it joins the inside part of the neck very gently. So we don't want to see a hard line where it starts, we want a nice soft line so it kind of brings it around. <clears throat> a little bit of highlight here and there on some of this fur on the lower part of the neck. Then we'll work on the top part. <coughs> so remembering that uh, at this point we've got to remember what our original idea was for the light. So obviously light coming through the trees, low left like that, early, very early morning light, probably slightly behind our wolf as well, hence that sort of backlighting effect, the light shining from the back. So if we do the bridge of the nose, the final shape of the bridge of the nose, and you can adjust the shape right up until this point of course, and turn that down up to the forehead, now we can't leave it like that, that's the backlighting, but it's a back, it's backlighting a two-dimensional shape. What we need to do is have some of that light spill over just a little bit. And if the light spills over a little bit, then it becomes a three-dimensional shape. As you would with a ball. You know, if you shine a light behind a ball, that highlight will just spill over the edge of the ball a little bit to show that it's not a disc. It will show that it's a three-dimensional object. Okay, now we can highlight that eyebrow on the left a little bit and then continue around that sort of backlighting effect very gently around the top of the head, short fur. Again, we can get the shape of the head. And 
to show you for the ear finally sorted out. Notice where we've got grey underneath, and we've got a, a soft greyish highlight. Where we've got brown underneath, you've got a very pale brown highlight. And so all the way around the tip of the ear. Very short fur around there, of course. Lean back and squint. If you need to make an adjustment, you can make that adjustment now. If the light a little bit stronger or not. Maybe just a, one or two key highlights on the top of the shoulder going down to the back. Soft highlights. Rub away the roots. Uh, have a tiny bit more on the cheekbone. Now, as far as the eye itself is concerned, the reflection, we may think, well, we can't really put a reflection on there because the light's on the other side. But we could. We could easily put a reflection on there and have it as a reflected reflection. So that light could be bouncing off something pale down here and bouncing back into the eye. Maybe it's reflecting an area of mist. So, we don't have to make it too sharp, but if we just do a little subtle, almost pale reflection on that, it just brings the eye to life a little bit. And a final touch on that eyebrow. And the last thing of all that we want to do is make it more atmospheric by having a, a bed of mist. As he's singing, howling, we can have some mist coming out his mouth in the same way as we created the mist for the base of the trees. So lots of little squares, rub it round and round and do as many layers as is required. Always remember that when it emerges from the mouth, from the mouth that mist is going to be stronger. The light is going to shine through it more and then it evaporates bit by bit up into the up into the air. But the little squares that we do is going to make it look more natural, more ethereal. It will fade away like so. So stronger around the mouth, fading out up above. Now we just bring that tooth back that we've lost with the mist. That one there. And those little highlights back, and I think we're about done there. So I'll sign it off. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this uh, little exercise in creating an atmospheric uh, painting. <coughs> um, so coming up on the screen are uh, details of where you can order the kit, if you want to order the kit from the website. Uh, also. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, every little helps. And there are also details coming up of how you can follow some exclusive tutorials and other lovely bits on my Patreon channel as well. So I hope you've enjoyed it. So looking forward to seeing your results. Please post them on Facebook and uh, spread the word, spread the, the wolf song if you like. And uh, we'll see you next time.